us the teacher. The world has never seen and never will see a better teacher than Jesus. He is the greatest communicator of all time. People said of Jesus, no man ever spoke like this man. He spoke with power and authority. The Bible says that people were astonished at the teachings of Jesus. He was so far superior to any other teaching they ever heard. And the Bible says that the common people heard him gladly. So while his teaching was uh, with authority and it was profound, it was also simple and delivered with grace. One of the features of Jesus' teaching style was he skillfully used picture language. This is something that good teachers today recognise in, in the education department and in Christian circles, that it's good to use visual aids and, and tell stories that either visually portray a picture or paint a picture in someone's mind. That helps people to understand what you've taught them and to make a connection between the, the picture and the lesson. So Jesus made very effective use of picture language. That's why he, he makes statements such as, I am the vine, or I am the door, or I am the bread of life. He talked about everyday objects that people would relate to to help them understand spiritual truths. And that's the case today in John chapter 10. Because in John chapter 10, Jesus painted a picture of sheep and a shepherd and a sheep hen because he wanted to teach us something about himself and about shepherding. So let's have a look at John chapter 10. And we'll read the first 16 verses. John chapter 10, verses 1 to 16. I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech so they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate, whoever enters through me will be saved. He, he will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The higher man is not the shepherd who owns the sheep, so when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a higher man and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one, one flock and one shepherd. Okay, let's just think about what this is talking about. What it would have meant to people back then. Because we are not particularly familiar with sheep and sheep pens, unless we see them on TV. Uh, many of us here would not have seen one of these firsthand. So back in Jesus' day, uh, it was very common, a sheep pen was an enclosure with uh, four walls and a small opening. And it might have come up to about a waist level or a chest height, made of bricks or stones. And the purpose of the sheep fold was two, twofold. Firstly, to protect the sheep from wild animals at night. There were wolves, bears and lions in the Middle East. So the shepherd would let the sheep out during the day, they'd feed on the grass, and then at night pull and bring the sheep in, into the enclosure, and he would actually sleep in the doorway, protecting the sheep from any wild animals. And the other purpose of the sheep pen was that it protected, that it prevented the sheep from wandering. The sheep like to sort of go around and have a look around and wander, and they're not particularly aware of danger, so it was for their own good to be kept within this enclosure. The shepherd's role was to protect the sheep 
to lead them to good pasture and a place where there was plenty of water, to go and find any sheep that had gone missing, and generally to look after their well-being. If it was necessary for him to take the flock somewhere else to find grass, he'd shelter them at night in a cave, or he'd make a makeshift sheep pen and sleep in the, the entrance to protect them. So that's the picture that Jesus painted. What I'd like us to focus on is three qualities of a good shepherd. And then Jesus takes each of the three qualities and applies them to himself. Because he is the shepherd of people. The first quality of a good shepherd is that he has a rapport with the sheep. Let's have a look at verses 2 to 4. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. So a good shepherd was familiar with his sheep. He knew each one by name. He had more than a general concern for them as a group of sheep. He was individually concerned for each sheep in the flock. If one of the sheep was sick, he knew about it and did something about it. If one of the sheep broke its leg, he would put its leg in a splint or put a bandage around its leg. If one of the sheep was sick, he'd personally feed the sheep and make sure that it was restored to God. And when it came time to lead the sheep out of the pen in the morning, instead of just saying, okay, let's go, whistling, and bringing the sheep out as a, as a group, he'd call each one by name. You can imagine the sheep that the shepherd called out, Bill, Joe, Fluffy, you know, he's given each one a name. And he has this rapport with them. And each sheep responds to the voice of the shepherd. Because there's that rapport there. So for a good shepherd, it was more than a job. He didn't just see the sheep as his livelihood or objects. His heart was in it. He had an affection for the sheep. Jesus said in verse 3 that the sheep listen to the voice of a good shepherd. So this rapport was two-way. Not only did the shepherd have an individual interest in the sheep, his care for the sheep produced trust in the sheep towards him. So when the shepherd called the name of an individual sheep, he would just trustingly run straight out of the pen. He wouldn't be worried is there a wolf outside because he knew if the shepherd was calling it out, he was safe. He had learned to trust in the shepherd. If a stranger called out to the sheep to come out, they wouldn't respond. Because they had learned to detect that voice of care that belonged to their shepherd. So that's the, the picture Jesus paints. He then takes this quality of a good shepherd that he's got rapport with the sheep and he applies it to himself. Verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Down to verse 27. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. See the likeness there? Just like a good shepherd, Jesus has a rapport with his sheep. And his sheep is the flock that we call the Christian church. That is one of the terms used in the Bible of the church, the flock of God. There's a beautiful rapport there between the Christian and Jesus. Every Christian can say, he knows me and I know him. We have entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ when we were converted. And he is more than our master. It's more than having Jesus as an authority figure. He's a friend. And he's a good shepherd. So he wants that personal relationship with every person. When we see him as our caring shepherd. And like a good shepherd, Jesus has a personal interest in each member of his flock. When Jesus says, I know my sheep, that's a thorough knowledge. 
He doesn't just look down upon the Christian church as a mass of around 700 billion people. He sees each person and knows us each by name. So if you're a believer this morning, Jesus knows your name. He knows your needs. He knows your hopes and dreams. He knows your hurts. And he knows the number of hairs on your head. That's the detailed interest that Jesus has in every person. He knows everything about your past. There may be someone here today, you've been through some difficult times in your past. There may be something that no one else on the face of the earth knows about. A little trauma that you went through and you kept it secret. Jesus knows about it. Because he has a detailed interest in your life. That's a comfort to know that he's that interested in us. That means that whatever we have been through, whatever struggles we have, we can go straight to Jesus and tell him about it. He already knows. We'll find a list in here when we turn to Jesus Christ. People may misunderstand, but Jesus is willing to listen. And we can tell him about those hurts. He knows your present circumstances today. Whatever trials you may be going through today, Wherever you're at in your Christian life today, Jesus knows that. And he has an interest in your spiritual well-being. And he knows your future. Jesus knows what's coming up tomorrow. That's a mystery to each one of us. But he knows. He knows where each of us in this room are going to be in ten years' time. That's the kind of interest he has in each person. In fact, he knows us better than we know ourselves. So he's the one to turn to when we're going through difficult times. He's the good shepherd. Now, as with a shepherd and his sheep, this rapport is two-way. Jesus wants us to grow in our knowledge of him. He wants us to be ever growing in that relationship, going deeper and deeper and deeper in our knowledge of him. Now, how do we achieve that? Would someone like to suggest how can we grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ? Read. Sorry? Read more. Read more. Get into the Word of God. And isn't it amazing that the Apostle Paul, who led many people to Christ, he travelled throughout Asia and Europe preaching the Gospel, at the end of all that he could say, I want to know Christ. It's an amazing statement. He'd known Christ for years, but he had an insatiable thirst to know Christ more and more. Just like two people can be married, and they might be married for six months. We're getting to know each other more and more. And I trust that in 20, 30, 40 years, Tom will still be getting to know each other more. That's the beauty of a relationship. And Jesus wants us to be going deeper and deeper and deeper in our lives with Him. And that comes through reading the Word, reading the Gospels over and over again, getting to know Christ, linking up with, with His heart, His attitudes. So it's important for every Christian to establish the discipline of regular Bible reading. We also get to know Jesus through communicating with him in prayer. And through attending Bible studies, coming to church, listening to messages about Jesus. That, and that is all helping us to develop that relationship with him. Then the rapport will be stronger the closer we are in him. Now, with each of these three qualities we're going to look at today, the first one being rapport, we'll find that there's an application for us. Jesus wants every person to have a shepherd's heart. This isn't something reserved for pastors or elders. This is for everybody. He's wanting us to have a concern for people. Every Christian parent is in the position of a shepherd. They are responsible to look out for the well-being of their children, particularly when those children are young. They're responsible to watch over them like a shepherd watches over his sheep to spend quality time with them so that they're developing a rapport with their children. And to be a friend as well as a parent. So that the parent is more than an authority figure, but someone that the child can relate to. And that kind of rapport is established through time spent together and care shown from the parent to the child. So I encourage the parents this morning to see yourselves as shepherds. And that's a beautiful role that God has given you. All Christians in leadership positions need to see themselves as shepherds. Elders, pastors, youth group leaders, 
Sunday school teachers. We need to see ourselves as shepherds. Going the extra mile to build rapport with people that God has called us to shepherd. That means doing things like inviting people home for a meal. Making sure we know everyone under our care by name. Taking time to talk with people and getting to know them and find out where their, their hurts and struggles are. Those who've got a shepherd's heart take the time to build rapport with people. It was said of King James V of Scotland that he was the poor man's king because every peasant who desired could get an audience with him. It didn't matter how poor someone was, he was the kind of king who had a heart for people and anyone could go and approach him and have time with him. Most kings don't have that kind of reputation. And people respond to that kind of care. You may have heard of a well-known Bible teacher in America named Warren Weasby. I've heard him testify that uh, in the two or three churches he pastored in America, that every now and then he'd go back and visit the church that he pastored for five or ten years. And he said he never ever had the experience of having one of his ex-church members come up and say, I never forgot that sermon you preached on the Lord's Prayer. Or I never forgot that series you did on the book of Ephesians. He never had anyone come up and say that. What he did have people come up and say was, I remember when my wife was in hospital and you visited us. I remember when my son had a car accident and you were there for our family. That's what people remember. And the responsibility of the shepherd is to be caring and meeting the needs of people. Then they will respond and there will be a beautiful report. Okay, let's look at the second quality of a good shepherd. Not only does he have a rapport with his sheep, he leads his sheep. The second half of verse 3. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Verse 4. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. So as well as developing this rapport with the sheep and caring for them, he provides leadership. He takes the sheep to the places where they need to go. He knows where the best pastures are. The sheep won't know that. Sheep aren't particularly intelligent animals. So the shepherd takes the sheep to where they need to go to find the best pasture. He knows that if he left the sheep to their own devices, they'd wander into dangerous places. Some of the sheep, the, the sheep would go uh, near the edge of a cliff or they'd go towards a den of wolves. So he lovingly leads them. It's not so much an authoritarian leadership, but it's leadership born out of care. Now, sheep need this kind of leadership because, as I mentioned, they're not particularly intelligent animals. The Bible likens people to sheep because we're stray prone. I remember when uh, I was living out at New Trials Mission, we had a large paddock there and a flock of sheep there. One day I was walking down a hill next to the paddock and all of a sudden, all the sheep that were running the paddock, they all started running flat out. And they went flat out from one end of the paddock to the other end and just stood there. As if to say, well, we've got from there to here, what do we do now? It was like one of the sheep had just decided to go for a trot and all the other sheep had joined in, but there was no purpose. And sheep are like that. They just wander all over the place. They run in a direction without any rhyme or reason. So they need the leadership of a good shepherd. And a good shepherd will lead them to the best place. If the sheep need to go down by the river, he'll take them down by the river. If they need to go into the valley, he'll take them down into the valley. If they need to go to a new paddock where there's better grass, he'll take them there. He won't lead them into dangerous places unless that's the only way to get to greener pastures. On the contrary, a hired shepherd, Jesus calls him a hired hand, he would do whatever was convenient for him. He'd be happy to have the sheep grazing where there was substandard grass and he'd pull his cooper over his face and have a snooze on the side of the hill. He wouldn't be particularly worried about the sheep. But a good shepherd, he goes the extra mile. He makes a special effort to make sure they look after. And that's how it is with Jesus and his care for us. He's the good shepherd. He makes, makes sure we go to the best places. He beckons us to follow him. 
like a good shepherd, he wins our trust first and then leads us out of his care for us. Have a look at the, uh, the order in verse 27. My sheep listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. In other words, Jesus establishes a relationship with a person, which commences when we're saved, and then once he's established that relationship, we willingly follow him. So the knowledge comes first, and then the following. This again highlights the importance of spending time with Jesus. Because the more intimate we are with Jesus Christ, the more readily we'll follow his lead. If we're spending time in the Word, we're getting to know him, we're familiar with his voice. So when Jesus speaks, we're more sensitive to pick up what he's saying. If we're not spending time in the Word and we're, we're so busy in life that we're just distracted by other things, and all the input we're getting is from the television and radio and magazines, we're not going to hear clearly the voice of Jesus. And he's going to be calling us to go in a certain direction. We're not going to hear his voice. We need to be tuned in to the Lord Jesus Christ who's spending time in his word. Now, when Jesus leads people, just like a shepherd leading sheep, sometimes he will lead us by the still waters. And we'll have a nice, peaceful day. One of those problem-free, enjoyable days. But is every day like that? Does, everyone, does anyone here today have a totally blissful life? Where every day is problem-free? And every day is just a dream run? No, none of us have a life like that. We live in a world of problems. And what's more, it's not Jesus' will that we have a dream run. Jesus leads us down into valleys. David said that he walked through the valley of the shadow of death. That was a place where God took him. Why does Jesus, Jesus lead us into valleys? When we're going through a difficult time in life, we may ask the question, if Jesus loves me, why is he leading me here? It was so much nicer by the still waters. Why am I going through this valley? Have you ever asked a question like that? Why is Jesus leading me here? The answer is, he leads us down into the valleys for our good. He wants to strengthen our faith. He wants to toughen us up so that we're strong and we can cope with trials that come our way in life. And the only way for him to toughen us up is to take us down into those valleys. See, the natural way to think is that what is easy must be best. In other words, having 100% good health all the time, it's natural to think that must be Jesus' will. That, that would seem like the best thing. Or, having perfect financial security where everything's neat and pigeonholed, we could tend to think that would be Jesus' will for every Christian. Or, having everything going smoothly at school, university or work. That must be Jesus' will, surely. But that is not the case. It's necessary that we go down into the valleys. And every good shepherd will take his sheep down into dark valleys if that's the only way to take them to good pasture. If they are running out of grass on a mountain, and he's getting concerned, you know, these sheep are going to starve if I don't find a better pasture for them. If the shepherd finds out that there is some beautiful green grass just on the other side of the valley, he will take his sheep down into a valley where it might be a little bit rocky, where it might be darker where there might be a few more wild animals, if that's the only way to get them to the greener pastures. And that is exactly what Jesus does with people. He wants to take us from where we are to somewhere where we're more spiritually mature. And the only way to get there is to go in through the valleys. To have a few bumps and scrapes along the way. And so Jesus takes us there for our good. And as we considered last week, we can have a positive attitude about some of the trials we go through. Because it's all part of God's good design. I was reading this week the life story of, or a summary of the life of Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby is one of the best known hymn writers. She writes songs like Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. 
and all the way the Saviour leads me. She wrote over 8,000 hymns. What is particularly remarkable is that she was blind. At the age of six weeks, a doctor made a terrible mistake. And as a result of the treatment he tried to give her, she was blinded for life. It was completely due to his incompetence. If anybody had reason to have a bad attitude for the whole of their life that was Fanny Crosby, she lived to 95. And she could have been bitter for her whole life over that doctor's mistake, leaving her blind. She could have been angry at God. But you know, she was never bitter. At the age of eight, she wrote this poem. Oh, what a happy child I am, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. So weep or sigh because I'm blind, I cannot nor I won't. She believed that that was something that came into her life by the hand of Jesus. And she later testified that if she hadn't been blind, she may never have written hymns. She may have been distracted by all the things that she would have set aside on. That's a positive attitude in a difficult time. That's what Jesus wants of us. That when we're going through a valley, we think, this must be for my good. And I'm going to come out the other side of this one day into greener pastures. Now, there's an application for us here. And that is for shepherds, pastors, elders, youth leaders, and so on. In fact, every Christian, because God wants us all to have a shepherd's heart, particularly towards new Christians. An implication is that leadership is an important component of shepherding. That we lovingly guide people. For those in leadership positions, God wants us to provide leadership for young people and for new Christians in particular. They need leadership. Young people particularly need our leadership because they face many temptations in the world. They're subject to peer pressure. A smorgasbord of temptation that comes through the media. The influence of books, magazines and the internet. There's pressure on young people to do what the TV tells them to do. To adopt the moral standards of people in Friends or Dawson's Creek. To dress like Britney Spears or some other pop icon. There's pressure on our young people all the time to be like the world is telling them to be. Satan is not failing in his efforts to provide leadership for young people. He's doing a fine job. He's succeeding. He's got a whole group of people following behind him while people following the fight pipe. And so the responsibility is on Christian parents and Christian pastors and youth leaders to be providing good leadership for young people. So that we're directing them onto the narrow road and away from the broad road of leads to destruction. We need to teach them the word of God, give them good advice, and warn them about the snares of the world. No, we're not omit to fulfill that responsibility. That is an important component of shepherding. And there may be someone here today, you can testify that someone had an input into your life when you were a younger Christian, and without that input, you might have gone astray. That's the critical nature of shepherding and discipleship. Let's move on now to the third quality of a good shepherd, and this is beautiful. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He goes to an extreme in his care for the sheep. Let's have a look at it in verse 11 to 13. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep, so when the, he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. A hired hand that abandons the sheep when a wolf appears on the scene because shepherding is just a job. He's got no particular interest in the sheep. He's just there to earn his day's wages. He's employed to look after a flock, so he does that, but he does not have any sense of ownership over the sheep. There's no rapport. And there's no concern. So he gives the sheep a clean set of heels if a wolf appears on the scene. But the shepherd who owns the sheep, he lays down his life for the sheep. He is so committed to those sheep that he will put himself between a wolf and the sheep. And this is the critical point. 
boy of what Jesus is saying here. That the good shepherd values the life of the sheep more than his own life. He risks his life to save them. Can you imagine looking after the sheep and seeing a bear appear on the scene? And running out to face that bear in order to save the sheep. That's what a good shepherd did. That's what David did. Remember when David stood before Saul and he was wanting to face Goliath and David said, I used to be a shepherd and when a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep, I went after it and struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. Can you imagine that running after a bear that's running away with the sheep in its mouth and hitting the bear, rescuing the sheep, then the bear's hand turns on you and striking the bear then. That's what David did on more than one occasion. And God gave him the strength to do that. And that was the kind of care that David had for his sheep. And it's likely that in Bible times there were shepherds who lost their lives trying to protect their sheep from wild animals. So it's a, it's a picture of love and sacrifice that Jesus brings here. Then Jesus applied that to himself. He said, I am the good shepherd. Jesus laid down his life for people. He made the supreme sacrifice. Jesus saw that you and I were in danger and he stepped in. He actually surpassed the action of a good shepherd in risking his life for the sheep. Because if a shepherd saw a wild animal coming towards his sheep, he would put his life at risk, but there was every chance that he would survive that he would be able to kill that lion on the bed, as David did, and he would survive. But Jesus did more than risk his life. He came down to earth knowing that he was going to die. It was a certainty. He went full on into this venture of leaving heaven and coming down to earth, knowing that one day he would be flogged, struck around the face, spat on, and nailed, nailed to a Roman cross, and six hours later died. He knew all of that ahead of time. Yet as the good shepherd, he chose to give up his life. That is the greatest sacrifice that's ever been made. Let's look at how Jesus described it in verse 17. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. That's a powerful statement. Jesus chose to give up his life for us. You know, on the day that Jesus was crucified, Pilate wasn't in control. The Jewish mob wasn't in control. In fact, the devil wasn't in control. Jesus was in control the whole time. He says here in verse 18, Nobody takes my life away from me. He could have called upon 12 legions of angels, thousands of angels, to just step in, swoop down from heaven, and rescue him. He didn't do that. On the day that Jesus died, he laid down his life. He was like a man willingly walking on its own to the place of sacrifice. That is the extent of the love of God, the love of Jesus for each of us. He saw that we were heading for the judgment of God. He saw that hell was looming for us. And he stepped in to rescue us. Jesus looked out from heaven upon people who were living then and saw them in their need and came to stay there. He looked into the future 2,000 years and saw you and I. Even before he laid down his life, he saw us in the future in our need and said, I'm going to die for that person. Because when Jesus laid down his life, it was not just for a mass of people. Not only did he die for the world, he died for individuals. The Apostle Paul could say, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. Everyone who's in this room today can say that. Jesus Christ loved me and gave himself for me. He had me in mind when he left heaven to come on this rescue mission. Each of us can say that. That's the degree of his concern for each human being. If there's anyone here today who is yet to trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, I want to encourage you from the Word of God today that 
Jesus laid down his life for you as an individual person. You're not a face in the crowd of Jesus. You might have been rejected by people. You might have been considered unimportant by people. You matter to Jesus. So much so that he laid down his life. He knows all about you. He knows where you're heading. He knows that you're heading for the judgment of God. That there's a judgment coming. The moment every person dies, they're appointed to judgment. And he knows that you're in danger. And so he stepped in before that judgment arrived and laid down his life for you. And all that God requires of you today is two simple things. Number one, to repent. Which simply means to agree with God. Say, God, I agree with what you say in your word about me, that I've sinned against you, I've broken your laws, I deserve your judgment. And number two, to believe. To believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Saviour, to say, I believe that when Jesus died on the cross, it was for me. He laid down his life for me. He suffered the punishment of God for me. And if you trust in Jesus Christ as your Saviour, God will save you. He will welcome you into his family. You'll become a member of the flock. And all that requires is simple repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you to make that decision today. If you have any questions about it, please talk to myself or Alan or one of the leaders here this morning. We'd love to share with you because this is the greatest news in the world. And please deal with that issue today because tomorrow is not a guarantee to end this. Okay, one final application for those of us today who, who know the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus wants us to imitate this third quality of a good shepherd. He wants us to be willing to lay down our lives for people. Now this will really mean the ultimate sacrifice, actually giving up our life. But what it does mean is giving ourselves away in order to be a blessing to people. Uh, you're, you're having a holiday Bible club soon. And there may be someone here you're wrestling with, should I help with the holiday Bible club or should I do the things I'd like to do that week? That's an opportunity to say, I'm going to give my life away for other people. I'll give up that week and use it in the Lord's service. Instead of going away on a holiday somewhere, doing something for myself. These are the kind of sacrifices that Jesus calls on us to make. To have a shepherd's heart and be concerned for people and to put ourselves out to help them. Well, there may be someone in the church who needs discipling. And it might be giving up one night a week to help that person instead of staying home and spending time with family. That's a sacrifice. But they're the kind of sacrifices that shepherds make. And he's wanting us to be concerned for the needs of people and make those sacrifices. Or it may be giving up a week of our holidays to help out at a youth camp or a, or a scripture union event. In a small way, to get involved in those things is following Jesus' example and giving up our life for the sake of others. So in conclusion today, I'd like to encourage us today to make it a personal objective to be shepherds. To follow Jesus' example. Number one, to build a rapport with people. Number two, to provide good leadership, particularly for young people and for new Christians. And number three, to be prepared to give our life away, to be a blessing to other people. May each of us here have a shepherd's heart, because that is part of being a Christ-like person.